Welcome back. You're watching Stock Picks, and today we unpack life, healthcare, net care, and discovery with Oyster Catch Investments. Vessel Yubab. Vessel, always a pleasure. Good afternoon to you. Hi, Nolu. Thanks for having me. Vessel, maybe before we get into the nitties of these counters, South Africa's private healthcare, how would you characterize uh, that sector at present, maybe? Well, it's gotten a lot of, um, I think, news lately with kind of a lot of talks about NHI going into the elections and a lot of parties using that um, to hopefully garner some votes. So the South African healthcare space, as you can imagine, a very small portion of the population is exposed to private healthcare, which is kind of the big focus point where you ideally want everybody in the in the country to have access to high-end healthcare. Now, what's been happening over the past couple of years Healthcare uh, inflation is usually above normal inflation. So the prices have been going up and up and up. And with that, we've seen repricing um, on the medical scheme side. And that has made it a little bit more unaffordable uh, for a lot of people to have healthcare. Mm. So you've had this stagnating market um, on the private healthcare side. And with less budget available on the public side, you've seen quite a lot of strain on the public uh, hospitals to supply enough health care to the public in general. Um, but we have seen quite a few very positive um, movements in that space as well, uh, especially in the Western Cape where we've seen them looking at partnerships with uh, large global players to build hospitals that you can still access at affordable rates for the general public. I actually want to get into uh, these counters in a bit, Vessel, but I must ask you about that issue of healthcare inflation. It's a very curious thing for me. What is driving it? Uh, you know, yeah. also considering that, uh, you, like you say, majority of the population is not on medical aid. Uh, you know, they're not on a private uh, healthcare, or if they do, maybe they might access it through cash, which I think is very rare. But then what is driving uh, this inflation? Yeah. So if you think about a hospital, um, the largest expenses in the hospital is, number one, the rent of the actual building. Um, so that's a very large portion. But on top of that, probably even more so, is the salaries that need to get paid to the staff. And in, the, in that space, in that case, it's specifically nurses. Mm -hmm. Now, what we have seen is there is, and it depends on whose research you look at, mm -hmm. but from what we can see, qualified, experienced nurses, there's a fairly large shortage of. So they've seen above inflation increases and, and this isn't only a South African phenomenon. There are, there's a big shortage of well-trained nurses globally. So what's been happening is the countries where that are willing to pay a little bit more for these nurses usually get them. So our South African providers unfortunately had to pay up a little bit to maintain or to keep the, the nurses. Um, and that's been a large driver of, I suppose, above inflationary increases. The other side of it is you can imagine there's quite a lot of um, a lot of medicine and imported products that goes into healthcare, um, and with the rand weakening, we've seen those prices increasing a lot. And then when you listen to the healthcare providers, their technology systems that they use, so that'll be your SAP or your Microsofts and so on. Those are usually priced in dollars as well, and with Currency weakening plus inflation picking up in the US and globally, we've seen those prices averaging, I think, about 20% per year increase over the past four years. So those, all those factors kind of come together and unfortunately culminate in above inflationary in cost increases in the hospital groups. Let's get into uh, then uh, some of them, maybe starting off with life healthcare. Uh, this one has tried to also diversify slightly against uh, our outside of being a traditional hospital play. Some hits, some misses, hey, Vessel? Yeah, I think a few more, few more misses than hits. Um, they've actually recently gotten rid of AMG. They try to expand uh, into the radiology market um, into Europe or in Europe, uh, predominantly UK and Italy. And they started off with very good margins and a couple of very good contracts. They did quite well going through COVID when in the UK specifically, they gave the people scans, uh, scans of your lungs specifically to see if you had COVID or not. Um, and a couple of temporary contracts like that boosted profits, but as conditions normalized, uh, the, pre the cost pressure there is, or 
the margins came under pressure um, as these contracts renewed at much lower prices. They then decided to sell the business, uh, which went through a couple of months ago. I think they actually went ex-dividend today. They made a six, six round special divvy. They maintained some of the cash that they got from the AMG deal to hopefully invest a little bit more in growth projects. They want to diversify away into radiology um, and pathology specifically, um, and a little bit oncology as well. They do do have some mental health as well, which seems to be doing well, but unfortunately that's still very, very small in South Africa. But the core of the business is still the hospital group. Um, and I think that's kind of, if you invest in a hospital group at this stage, that is what you are investing in. And that portion of the business is most hospitals globally act more like a hotel than an actual hospital. If you can imagine, you've got a lot of fixed costs mm -hmm. with a lot of open beds. You want to fill those beds to the maximum capacity that you can, um, depending on, on the hospital group they usually tend to be fully occupied at about 75%. And that just means you can't fill the beds to 100%. The hospital will be too full. There's a lot of other contagion issues and so on that, that creep in when that happens. So yes, they've been trying, they did try to, to deviate away from the hospital business um, as the longer term margins globally are a little bit more under pressure there. But so far they haven't been successful in that. I must ask you, Vessel, uh, you know, these hits and misses we're speaking about, is this a strategy issue or is it a market issue? It's very difficult to say. Mm. At that point in time, it might have been the best option that you had. Unfortunately, it didn't turn out that well. Um, and often you see these businesses generating high margins. You have them in your hospital, so you do have some access to their financials and kind of a view of what their business is and what it's looking like and you tend to think it's a good line to go into um, often what happens is those businesses are small or have a very high margin in at a particular time and as the market kind of matures or evolves those margins tend to fluctuate up or down in this particular case when you listen to what discovery has been saying recently um, the money that or they are of the opinion that in hospital patients generally get over-treated um, in radiology and pathology, i.e. when you're lying in bed and the doctor just wants a quick update of your condition, they would tend to just send, your, send you for a full um, blood lab result, which might be unnecessary. Mm -hmm. Same for scans. When you've broken a bone or had an operation, um, they might send you for one or two additional scans. That's probably unnecessary, but they'd rather do it to be on the safe side. Mm -hmm. um, so within those businesses, the profits and the margins look very, very good. But Discovery also made the point that in South Africa, I think the current uh, percentage is about 8% of operations are treated in daycare hospitals, whereas in the US that is closer to, I think, 32%, if I remember correctly, 32 to 38% which means that if South Africa is on the same trend, these radiology businesses and pathology businesses within the hospitals might become a little bit less profitable as they lose more and more volumes. That is a very interesting a dynamic. I actually want to then jump straight into discovery because, of course, uh, they're on the insurance side, uh, you know, of the sector. And we've seen them branch out. You know, they've got businesses uh, with China and uh, really trying to branch out as a group. It does tell me, um, you know, um, Vessel, that what we're seeing with medical health care in South Africa, it could be ex-growth. I'm not sure if that's the right term to use here. But there's just so many uh, employed people. We're struggling to create jobs. We're struggling to increase increased salaries, uh, there might not be uh, anywhere to go where uh, Discovery Health is concerned. Yeah, that's exactly, I think, the point that a lot of the, the private players are making um, and pleading with government to kind of create jobs, get the economy growing so that you have people earning more and being able to afford these services. Because I don't think necessarily you can bring down the cost of these services significantly enough for the broader population to be able to afford them anyway. The, the big thing I think what Discovery noticed or the re, some of the reasons for Discovery's branching out is when you look at the South African healthcare space, the medical scheme beneficiaries haven't really been growing over the past couple of years. 
we've seen in the private space that's going backwards slightly with a little bit of growth in gems and that's effectively your your public sector kind of creating those jobs which i don't think is necessarily sustainable in the long term and the way discovery makes their money as a or on the at least the, the biggest pension fund administrator and the way they make money there is charging a fixed fee administration fee per policy so they do need policies to increase they're fighting very hard to keep the costs that they pay they will negotiate a rate for the hospital for certain operations and certain procedures um, they then try to negotiate those rates as low as possible to keep the price of the insurance as low as possible to make it as accessible to the broader population as possible um, because they want numbers if they can increase the number of, of beneficiaries their administration costs go up and so on and then what we've seen is they've built out a very very good consumer base in this space and now they're trying to access additional returns out of this consumer base i.e short-term insurance was a very good successful business so far branching out into banking and it looks like they might be very successful there in the future and then some of their selling some of their technology um, to some of the overseas healthcare providers to kind of benefit off of getting a lower risk beneficiary um, onto your policy scheme to IE. That's what we all know as vitality. Um, and those those do seem to be very promising, but unfortunately the all majority of them at least are still draining cash from the highly cash generative SA uh, based businesses, if you want to call it that. Uh, let's touch on life. Uh, let's touch on net care rather, Vessel, because I want to come back to discovery here, especially when we rank these stocks and which uh, might be the best one to enter the private healthcare space if that's what a retail investor would like to do. But unlike uh, life healthcare, net care is speaking about uh, margin expansion. Uh, I'm wondering what it is about uh, their model uh, that might be ha have them uh, having a better time than what life healthcare may be having. Yeah. So over the past all of 10 years, I think Netcare has been classified as quite quite a boring company uh, with unimaginative uh, management. They never try to branch out or do anything fancy in terms of radiology and so on. They would do smaller projects. They've got a, what they call a care on project, which is digitization um, of a lot of the healthcare records, trying to eke out efficiencies uh, where you can have a similar or better level of care, but with maybe fewer nurses or fewer, fewer doctor intervention um, into your care. So maybe automating the process if a doctor prescribes you uh, a few medicines, um, automatically cross-checking if they clash with anything else that you're taking, saving the time of the doctor to go cross-reference that themselves. So they've had a couple of projects like that that they've been experiencing or spending money on. And even with those, they've been able to increase their their margins. Now, the big difference between life healthcare and net care most recently um, on the margin side was we saw life bidding for some of these medical scheme contracts. Um, often you can become the primary provider, uh, but you have to give a fairly big discount. It seems like life healthcare gave a very big discount. Um, whereas normally, as I mentioned, these things are basically hospitals, so uh, hotel groups. So you want to fill as many beds as possible. Generally, your fixed your cost base is fairly fixed. Now it seems like Life gave away a little bit too much on pricing. They already had a portion of those clients on their books, which they then also had to give the discount to. All of that culminated into increasing volumes, but not really increasing margins, unfortunately. Whereas those contracts were actually won from Netcare, and Netcare weren't willing to bid at those lower prices, meaning the volumes that Netcare did add on, on their side were margin accretive to their business. And um, that is the one part of it. It is also another smaller thing. When you look at the revenue and the EBITDA per bid mm. for Netcare, they were a little bit further behind Life Healthcare over the past couple of years. So there's a little bit of room there that they are catching up on whereas life was a very, very lean business, very well managed, and they seem to have slipped a little bit on their side. So it's a story of a couple of things culminating into those margins. Before we move away from Netcare, we do see a leadership change here. Uh, you know, Dr. Richard Freeland, I think after 18 years. I'm keen to get your thoughts on that one. Uh, this, could this be a new dawn for Netcare, a uh, new leadership, bolder leadership, riskier leadership? Yeah. Um, 
We'll have to wait and see who will replace him. We do know that they are looking for an outside um, replacement, which might mean that they they are looking for a change of what they were doing previously. Uh, I do think it might be a little bit of a different strategy. Somebody taking them, I mean, everything that Richard has done up to this point with implementing this digitization strategy, keeping the business stable, they deleveraged the business quite well. Um, it provides a very, very strong base for somebody with a bit more um, modern views, I think, to grow the business or gain a bit of market share in South Africa. With that said, Vessel, for our retail investors are watching at home, are keen to uh, get a bit of the private healthcare space within their portfolio. Uh, which, which, what, how would you rate them, maybe from one to three? Uh, which direction would you take? At these levels, I think my top pick would probably be Netcare. I do think the share price has derated quite quite considerably. Uh, you're looking at a business that's probably going to generate roughly about 10% free cash flow at these levels, um, growing at roughly 5%, so slightly below inflation on, on kind of a, a stable business environment, maybe a little bit more in the next year or two as these uh, digitization costs come out of the system. Um, second to that, probably life healthcare. After cleaning up the business, they do have a fairly straightforward South African business that with a bit of bit of tweaking, they can operate slightly more efficiently. And then um, discovery right at the end there, I suppose a little bit of concern as to where the cash flow within discovery is. Um, and we have yet to see the very good returns out of these investments that they are making. I've got no doubt that they are coming. The question is just when. And of course, in our educational segment, I think we've already actually touched on this. It was the basis of our conversation today. Accessibility diminished uh, vessel. Maybe a quick 101 on that one. Apologies, I missed your question there. I'm asking about our educational segments, which I think we have already touched on there. The, you know, sure. the expensive nature of healthcare costs in South Africa. Yeah. Yeah. No, exactly that. So the, the big reason in all of these companies have been under a little bit of pressure is their core market. You have a struggling economy, a large potential call it a large target market a lot of people that really need your services but unfortunately you have a bit of a mismatch that a lot of the things that you're buying and providing are pr priced in dollars unfortunately even your nursing staff as i mentioned priced in, a, in a, another currency or a hard currency at this stage which means that unless you have the ability to pass through pricing which we are also seeing as diminishing from their perspective um, from discovery side, an affordability issue, and from life and net care, um, you've got the caps either coming from NHI potentially, or it's being placed on you from kind of a, a medical scheme side. Um, just that margin squeeze that you have when you don't have pricing power, yet costs are a little bit outside of your control. Well, always a pleasure having you on Stock Picks. Vessel, thank you so much for taking us through this sector. That was Oyster Catcher Investments, a vessel you've had.